O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and welcome in your holy presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Tuesday, January 23rd, 2007. Good morning, Almighty God. In my Bible reading this morning, Psalm 27, 14th verse, wait for the Lord. He will come and save you. Be brave, stout-hearted, courageous. Yes, wait and He will help you. Had a letter from Jason Mon yesterday. His mentor wants Jason and I to meet. Won't you guide me, Lord, in this? I would like to be strong enough to do it. Help me. Then put it all together so it will be. Bless Jason. I pray his heart and mind is ever as sincere. Be with me, O oh God, as I try to sift through all of this. May I know you will. My mind says revenge. My heart says forgive. Help me, Father. Amen. This entry is from a prayer journal written by my friend Betty Mayers, who died two years ago. We became friends in 1996 when I was a pastor in Wichita, Kansas, going through my own season of asking for God's help and my own brokenness. Our worship services were broadcast live every Sunday, and Betty and her husband Lonnie watched. The Jason Mon she writes about is the young man who at 16 robbed a convenience store in her small hometown of Syracuse, Kansas, and shot her son, John, who was working there. John died two days later from the wounds. It is impossible to describe the aching hole that's left in her heart and the unspeakable boy in her life. During the process of trying to make sense of this tragedy, which I dare say never made any sense, Betty wrote me asking for a favor. About a year later, after her son died. In her letter, she said, in last Sunday's bulletin, act of forgiveness, I just really am having a very difficult time forgiving the young 16-year-old youth who killed our John, and also his parents who covered up for him. I pray daily and search the scriptures for help. I pray for them, but deep down I know I have not really forgiven them. I want to, but it just isn't coming. I just thought maybe you would have a bit of advice that I haven't already had. I'm here to tell you that's one of the toughest favors I've been asked for. And I remember thinking, what wisdom in all humbleness could I possibly offer a mother whose only child, adopted at birth and beloved in life, was taken by an act of violence? My journey this week into the heart of forgiveness came in reading our text today that Stefan shared with us. 
That moment in scripture when Jesus bound to a cross for a crime he didn't commit becomes the centerpiece for a conversation among guards and religious leaders and then criminals. To the guards and leaders who mutter while casting lots for his clothes, if you're the king of the Jews, why don't you save yourself? Jesus answers, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I suddenly became aware that Jesus asked God to forgive them. For God to transform the ignorance of their words and actions into an experience of grace. And then remembering his conversation moments later with one of the criminals who told the other one to be quiet for condemning Jesus, I heard the heartfelt plea of this man saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. That is what we hope for. As people of faith, that even in our brokenness, even in our trying to make sense of unbelievable hurt and pain in our lives, there is a path to paradise. A path through which God can make forgiveness possible, even when for us it seems impossible. In an article in the journal Presence, a writer describes how liberating it was for her to hear following a series of traumatic moments in her life, you don't have to forgive. When I read those words and thought of countless people in my own life, including Betty, who have experienced trauma, I realized the naked truth of these words. You don't have to forgive. The pain is too unbearable. The act too much for this moment. And then remembering Betty and, and her own experience of trauma and how her own desire in life was to be with Jesus in paradise, alongside her beloved son John and her husband Lonnie, nearly every day in her prayer journals, she asked for forgiveness. Her yearning was deep as was her pain. And sometimes the yearning and the pain wrestled into uncertainty. So when she asked me for advice, all I could offer was this. Thank you for sharing your struggles with forgiveness. In sharing the struggle, it appears to me that you have already begun the journey toward forgiveness. I'm coming to see forgiveness not as something we live up to, but rather something we live into. Too often we have a tendency to move too quickly, hoping that the sooner we forgive, the more quickly everything will be okay. But as you and Lonnie know, grief tells us something very different. Grieving takes time. And grieving moves at its own pace. To live into forgiveness releases us to experience forgiveness as a gift that grows in us gradually, not instantly. Flora Wellner says that forgiveness means to release the other person from our expectations. To release the other person from our expectations. I don't know if anything I shared with Betty made a difference, but I do know that over the nearly 20 years of our friendship, we talked a lot about forgiveness and how it gets to the heart of our pain. One of my favorite writers, David White, says this about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a heartache and difficult to achieve because, strangely, 
it not only refuses to eliminate the original wound, but actually draws us closer to its source. To approach forgiveness is to close in on the nature of the hurt itself. The only remedy being, as we approach its raw center, to reimagine our relation to it. When Jason Mon was released in 2001, after serving only five years as a juvenile, Betty and I talked about her concerns on his release and the likelihood of his reoffending. We also talked about her inner fears of him coming back to town. He did reoffend and returned to jail. Yet over the course of time, Betty continued to grapple with the tension between her mind saying revenge and her heart saying forgive. In 2006, she wrote this letter to Jason. Hi, Jason. This is a letter I'm sure you thought you'd never receive and I have felt like I would never be able to write. But being bitter and unforgiving has stripped 11 good years from my life. I have prayed both for you and for me for a long time. And now I am at the point where I can tell you that I forgive you for what you did to our John 11 years ago. I want it all to be over. Can we start from here and become friends? Which I'm sure is what God wants us to do. You have a lot of years ahead of you, and I want all of them to be good ones for you. This is my prayer. This letter came in reply less than two weeks later. Dear Mrs. Mayers, I am truly sorry for the pain I have caused you and for the terrible mistake I made. There is no excuse or reason for it. I was confused and stupid, trying to be something that I am not. It is always in my mind and I regret it every day. My prayer is that Jesus will bring you peace and that one day you will be with your son. In heaven. You are a brave Christian woman to write that letter. In God and Jesus, you give me hope that I can change. Because I don't want to hurt anyone else. And I don't want to put my family through any more pain. Thank you for your prayers. And I also pray for you and your son. Within a year or two after that, Betty received a letter and then spoke on the phone with Jason's mentor in hopes that they could meet in person. I don't know that they ever did. But I do know that Betty was willing. So please know this. Forgiveness is an acknowledgement of our deepest wounds and a yearning for paradise shaped in grace.
but even more so. Forgiveness is an act of choosing love. And in choosing love, letting love do its work. May that be our practice. May that be our faithfulness. May that be our blessing.